So now that that's out of the way, we're going to get to the most important list that I have planned for today. The next one we're going over is the bottom 10 for 2021. A lot of these already have videos on them, so I will link them either in the description or I'll put a picture of the video that they belong to just in case you're interested to know more of my thoughts on them. So first up we have Twilight and New Moon by Stephanie Meyer. I originally had plans to do a video over the entire series, but after New Moon I really don't think that I can get through the rest of the series. In both of these first two books, they follow Bella Swan and her new life in Forks, Washington, where she meets a young, old, hot twink who is constantly refraining from eating her. Romantic, right? Twilight itself was really entertaining to read and trash talk as I went, mostly because the writing is surprisingly poorly done and the whole story feels like you're dealing with an extreme case of pick me girl. I really really wish now that I'd gone through and marked every single page that mentions Edward's crooked smile. I started to do that in New Moon and only got two pages out of it because I didn't realize exactly what the book was about. So maybe one day I'll get back around to rereading it just for kicks and solely just to mark those pages because it happens a lot. New Moon wasn't nearly as much fun to read. Um, I know that it is super important because it sets up all of Jacob's world and everything. But with him being only 15 in this book and 18 year old Bella fawning over his friends and him the entire time, talking about how hot they are and describing their bodies, it felt really creepy to me and I was not comfortable with it at all. Nothing super interesting uh, happens in it. I mean, there are some intense moments like with Bella riding the motorcycle and everything, but for the most part, she just sits around and cries about Edward. And things don't really pick up until the last couple of chapters when they go in to see the Volturi, and that's what I was more interested in, um, learning about that group than what Jacob and Bella are doing. There are a lot of reasons behind why I don't want to finish this series. Um, the biggest two that I will name off has to do with the imprinting situation because I've heard the girl on TikTok who goes by Twilight Talks talk about that in particular. And it just gets really creepy and I don't understand it and it does not seem like it would be fun to read more frustrating than anything. I also have a really huge problem with her reasoning behind why she did not write any POC characters into this series. I don't understand why she believes what she does. Um, I just can't support somebody who thinks that way. So all in all, this series is probably not for me. Um, I have no intention of finishing it, but if I ever do, then you'll be hearing about it, I promise. Next, we have Valley of Horses by Jean M. All. I have a whole video about the first two books in the Earth's Children series. Um, if you haven't seen that, I would recommend you go watch that because it goes way into depth about um, the things that happen in it. So for now, I'm just going to glaze over it real quick. I am only putting Valley of the Horses on this um, bottoms list and not Clan of the Cave Bear because the first book paints a really vivid picture of what life for prehistoric people was most likely like. And it, more specifically, it follows the life of Ayla as she is adopted into the Clan of the Cave Bear and tries to fit in. The second book, which is Valley of Horses, picks up after she has been exiled from the Clan of the Cave Bear and she begins living on her own. And it also picks up two extra characters, which are brothers, and inevitably their paths cross at some point. Clan of the Cave Bear was intense, informative, and very intriguing in how it presented the different ways of survival. While Valley of Horses really just felt like an erotica um, with a few tiny sections of struggle. After reading Clan of the Cave Bear, I was very excited to get a hold of this book and start reading it, mostly because I enjoyed the different aspects of the people and the animals from the first book, but this one fell really short of my expectations for it. I have no intentions of finishing the rest of this series. The first one is the only one that really struck a chord for me, so I will just leave it at that. Interview with the Vampire is one of those books that I was kind of hesitant to put on the bottom list solely because um, Anne Rice passed away a few weeks ago and I don't want to make it seem like I'm speaking ill of the dead, but this book really belongs on this bottom list because of some of the problems that I have with it. So the plot behind Interview with the Vampire begins as a young boy enters an old Louisiana home um, with the job of recording 
an old man who has hired him to record the story of his life. The catch is, this man is a 200 year old vampire who has done and seen things that would turn your hair white. I really looked forward to this one because I've been doing my best to get into vampiric stories. Um, so far they've kind of disappointed me, so I had a lot of hope for this one. This one did start off pretty strong. Both Lewis and Lestat are entertaining and troublesome. Um, they are constantly getting into stuff that you just are like, why guys, why are you doing this? So I was in it up until the point that they introduced Claudia. After that, I was kind of out. Claudia is a five-year-old girl that they find um, grieving over her parents who have passed away from the plague, if I'm remembering that correctly. And one of them ends up drinking from her and they accidentally turn her into a vampire and condemn her to a life of living inside the body of a child. To try and correct this, they decide to take her in as their own child and raise her. But after a few years, Lewis starts talking about her in more intimate ways. You can try and justify it by saying, but Taylor, she was in her 60s by the time he started referring to her as his bride. I don't care, it's still creepy. To me, I mean, I think what really bothers me most is how often he jumps between calling her his child or his daughter and his bride. It gets muddled there and just why would you think that way? I don't know, um, I guess being a vampire would screw with your mind, but it just makes no sense to me and it feels very, very gross. The story was very interesting and I would honestly be lying if I said that I didn't enjoy this at all because there were parts that I liked a whole lot, but it was mainly that that made me uncomfortable and I just couldn't get past it. The Sundown Motel by Simon St. James begins in 1982 with Vivian as she moves to Fell, New York on her own and ends up becoming entwined in a missing persons case. Her attempt to solve this mystery leads to her own disappearance and inevitably brings her niece Carly in um, to investigate it in 2017. At first I was pretty pulled into this story. Um, I thought that I was really going to enjoy it solely because of Vivian's part of the story, but once Carly came in, it kind of lost me. Everything that Carly does and learns is following in the footsteps of her aunt, so everything that you figure out and you're told throughout the story is basically just regurgitated and repeated to you as Carly learns it as well. I am personally so tired of horror and mystery novels trying to shoehorn in some kind of romance. If they have a purpose, that's great. I don't mind it whatsoever. But when they're only there to do one thing and the rest of the time they just, their only use is to be attractive, it gets old and you just don't care about that character enough to worry about them. The ending was also slightly disappointing to me, mostly because it felt super rushed and the whole ceiling twist at the end was very confusing. Like, were they hallucinating the whole time? Was it just a last ditch effort to have an extra twist in the story? I'm not sure. It's not really ever clarified and I didn't quite understand it. So many people rave about this story. Um, I can see where it would be really interesting to some people. So it mostly just wasn't for me. Um, and it's not what I look for whenever I read stories like this. Next, we have The Silent Patient by Alex Michaelitis. I think I'm saying his name right. If not, please correct me. This was one of those, the hype made me do it things. Um, I was very excited about it and ended up deciding to listen to it um, through Audible. And I'm very glad that I did because if I had picked up a physical copy of this, I probably would have DNF'd it real quick. Alicia Berenson, a well-known painter, is placed in a mental health institution after being found with the body of her husband. No one can get her to speak or react to them, and so as a whole, everyone just assumes that she is guilty because she doesn't come forward to say that she wasn't the one who did this. Then enters Theo, a very upbeat therapist who is determined to get Alicia to talk to him no matter what it takes. In my honest opinion, I think that you should go watch Gothica. You know, the Halle Berry movie. It's great. This is kind of that same story, except with a few different details to it and a really irritating twist. Theo is a unreliable narrator who comes in like he's going to save the day, sweep Alicia off her feet, and get her to tell the truth about what's happening. But in all reality, 
He ends up being someone who's super pushy and he makes the most irritating decisions that no sane human being would make, especially someone who has a degree in psychology. The timeline for the story is um, very confusing and kind of irritating in how it makes everything that Theo does up until the end um, contradict with itself. The reviews for this book are very mixed and I stand on the side of those who found it to be really disappointing. Sometimes I Lie by Alice Feeney follows Amber as she semi wakes up from a coma and starts trying to put together the pieces of why she is there and how it happened. She can't fully bring herself out of it, so the story is uh, mostly made up of memories, dreams, and thoughts that she is having while she is still in this coma coming in and out of consciousness. This book started really strong as well. I was very interested in figuring out what happened, but it feels like it hits a wall at some point and you're kind of like, why am I still listening to this? I looked up the reviews for this one and was very relieved to find that I'm not the only one who is um, having trouble with this book. It seems like most people were unpleasantly be bewildered by the ending and um, none of us were very pleased with the lack of payoff for the things that were set up earlier in the story. Next up is 112263 by Stephen King. Jake Epping is your typical high school teacher who gets involved with a situation and agrees to step through the rabbit hole in order to attempt to save JFK from his assassination. Along the way, he travels to many familiar places, saves a lot of people, and has to fight against the past in order to succeed at what he is doing. Does he succeed? Yeah. I will say that um, I don't feel like it's really a spoiler because you only get about 10 minutes of his success before he changes his mind and ruins it. Um, I get why he changed his mind and why he went back, but we go through the whole damn story just for you to do this, man. Like, I, I don't know. <laughs> this is another one that really frustrated me. If you're a history buff, this will probably be really interesting to you. There were a lot of points that um, had my attention like when they describe the way that the world used to be. Aside from how interesting that was, the ending really made me feel like I had wasted my time. Jake comes in empty-handed and he leaves empty-handed and it just was not satisfying. When this book first came out, I was a huge Stephen King fan. Um, I constantly was reading his books, uh, so I was really excited to get hold of this one, but it took me so many times to try and get through this. I bought two physical copies of it um, I had to start the audible at least three times before I could finally get past the halfway point. I think that that was due to the excessive core dumping that happened in this. It feels like there were a lot of things that could have been cut out of it um, for time's sake. You get lots and lots of details about things that ultimately don't matter in the end. And there are extra side stories that would have been great short stories on their own. Um, I had high expectations for what was going to happen. I thought that Jake may take his love interest to the new world and she would either crumble into ashes as soon as they stepped through the rabbit hole or maybe she would go crazy because of the things that she's seeing and can't quite comprehend it all but instead we don't get any of that and you're left just just to give you an idea of the time you would have to put into this, um, for the audible reading, it is 30 hours and 40 minutes long. So I think that's why I'm mostly irritated by this book is because it has a lot of time and for what? With the honeymoon killer at large, Detective Lindsay Boxer has her hands full. Not only does she have to catch this guy before anyone else gets hurt, but she is also dealing with a very unexpected illness. This was my first Patterson book and it didn't impress me much. So much of this felt like a really cheap ploy to make you feel um, bad for Lindsay Boxer as she goes through these trials. I feel like Patterson didn't think that he could stick just to the detective story. I mean, you gotta have a love interest, right? Chicks love love interests and romance. But even he was dispensable. I mean, the sickness and the love interest were both thrown out the window as soon as it wasn't convenient anymore. And it was just weird. I don't know. Maybe all of his books are cheesy like that. It wasn't a terrible book. Um, there were some moments that I was very invested in what was happening, but... 
overall it was pretty predictable and that's not ideal for a mystery thriller novel so I would say overall it was just way too cheesy for my taste. Wheel of Ice by Stephen Baxter begins aboard the TARDIS as the Doctor, Jamie, and Zoe find themselves hurtling towards an unknown destination. After dodging asteroids and debris they end up on a mining facility built around one of Saturn's moons. Together they must solve the mystery of the blue dolls in the rift between parents and teenagers and ultimately find out exactly what is lurking at the center of this moon. I absolutely adore Doctor Who so I was very upset that I wasn't as into this story as I felt like I should have been and I kind of blame it on the fact that I have never really watched the second Doctor's series. The only reason that I have this book a part of this list is not because I thought it was bad, but because of how slow it felt compared to a usual Doctor Who story. Okay, we have finally, finally reached the last book on my bottom 10 list. Um, this one probably belongs on the bottom of the list, even though I didn't put these in any particular order because I just didn't have the heart to go through and say, okay, this was the best worst book and this was the worst worst book. But I think that this one definitely, I can say, was my least favorite of the year. So last we have No Longer Human, adapted by Junji Ito, and the original author for this is Osamu Dazi, um, and his novel is of the same name. Yozo Oba has had a very horrible life, and this book really details his downward spiral into madness and ultimately leading to death. His way of coping throughout this entire time is to be the class clown any chance he can find. This book is very intense. It is super depressing, and I have absolutely no intention of seeking out the original novel strictly because of that. It was a lot to take in. I picked this up because um, I am a huge fan of Junji Ito. His art is incredible. It really depicts the horrors of the mind in the most beautiful way. I, I mean, I'm currently wearing a Tomi t-shirt and you can see right here all of the Ito books that I have. So it really disappoints me to not enjoy this, but I really uh, will pin that on the story itself and not his artwork. I honestly don't think that I would have picked up this book had I known what I was getting into. From the beginning, there um, are depictions of sexual assault against a child, and that was sickening. Um, I actually put this down for a long time and didn't pick it up until I was just like, okay, I either need to sell this and get rid of it, or just finish it and see what it's about. Hoping that at some point it would get happier, but no, it's just a straight shot down for Oba until he hits rock bottom and he is just constantly sleeping around with people. It was not fun in any way. I know it has a lot of good intention and meaning behind it, but I think that the intensity of it was too much for me to get past to be able to enjoy any of it. I wouldn't say that it's bad. Um, like I said with the themes being important and the stuff that it talks about, but uh, I just personally couldn't ext uh, handle how freaking extreme that it gets and that is my pure trigger warning ahead of time. Um, I'm not going to show any art from the inside like I normally would if I were showing off um, a manga or a graphic novel just because it is very triggering. 